Okay. All right, good, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the March installment of our first Friday webinar, uh, which is designed to provide value-added information for our clients and others. Uh, this is Daryl Groves. I'm glad that you are able to join us today. We'll be recording today's webinar, and we'll make it avail available later for viewing on our website under the Client Center. The format, for, the format for our webinar will be as follows. All participant lines will be muted, um, but questions can be raised during the presentation using the Q&A comment box to the left. Uh, we will make every effort to answer questions during the Q&A session. Any additional questions will be answered offline. We will also be using polling questions as a means to gather information from our audience. And as always, we will, you will, uh, you are more than welcome to set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting to cover additional questions or concerns that you may have regarding your tax accounting or other financial management needs. Our agenda today as follows. We'll, uh, we have one guest presenter today, Rashana Lilly, and she'll talk about small business retirement plans. And then after that, we'll have a Q&A session. Okay, well, just to uh, remind you about our team, uh, we're so blessed and, and, and thankful to be working with a fabulous team of dedicated professionals that are focused every day on providing the best service to our clients. Joe Martinez heads up our accounting team and works diligently to make sure that your financial statements are prepared accurately and timely. Uh, Wendy Pineda is our tax lead and she's focused on coordinating client tax planning throughout the year and ensuring that our annual tax return filing process uh, runs smoothly and efficiently. Simone Duncan and Emma Martinez are on the front line providing accounting and tax support. And Ellen Hughes is our firm administrator managing our accounting, payroll, insurance, and other items. So feel free to contact any one of us if you have any questions. So for those of you not yet subscribed, we do also offer a free monthly newsletter that features four to five brief, brief articles each month that are designed to keep you updated year round on tax updates and information you need to manage your business finances. You know, it's amazing how many times that I've gotten a question and just been able to refer um, refer the person to an article that was on our news play, uh, our newsletter uh, at some point, and you know, it usually answers it in a, a very straightforward manner. So to subscribe to our newsletter, you just go to our website at dwgcpatx.com and select subscribe at the top right corner you'll receive an email asking you to confirm your subscription and that's it. You know, this will ensure that you stay up to date and it may spark a question or two, um, and, you know, and just know that we're here to help you. We also are active on social media. Uh, you can get more frequent updates by liking our page on Facebook, uh, following us on Twitter, or just by connecting via LinkedIn. So as I mentioned, we will be conducting a couple of polls throughout the webinar. So here's the first poll of the day. Yeah. So this one is about um, your retirement, uh, personal re retirement savings. How do you feel? And uh, let's see, are we? Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, that's good so far. Okay. Kind of in the middle. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well. Well, it's good to know that uh, not very many people are at. Um, or at least the people that we have responding or, or have at least started the process. Yeah. Let's see. Go back. Okay. All right. 
Okay, well, great. So, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, our guest speaker today is Rashana K. Lilly. Rashana Lilly is a financial advisor and associate vice president at Ameriprise Financial with 11 years of experience. She is, she is one of the partners with McGill, the Grange, Lilly, Chu, and Associates. She has been honored with the nationally recognized Five Star Wealth Management Award from 2013 through 2016. Rashana received her BA in Finance with a minor in Banking from Sam Houston State University. She is a certified financial planner and a chartered re retirement planning consult counselor. She also holds licensing related to financial planning, including health, life insurance, Series 7, uh, and Series 66, uh, and is licensed in nine states. So, Rashana, welcome and good morning. Good morning, everyone. So, what I will do, I will be extremely uh, cognizant of everyone's time on a Friday afternoon. Uh, I will essentially enlist in participation from all of the um, the attendees as far as questions. So feel free to pose uh, a question while I'm speaking. And uh, one of us, either someone on Daryl's team or myself, uh, will try to respond to you if it's something a little bit more detail. Uh, we're happy to follow up with you um, offline after the webinar. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, just like the titling says, we're going to be talking about a variety of small business plans, from simple plans um, as far as IRAs, individual retirement accounts, to the more sophisticated that go more so into the pension realm or um, defined benefit plans. So let's move forward. This is one of the illustrations I love to show, and it goes back to the importance of starting and not waiting until you feel as if your cash flow is substantial enough to uh, solidify a large uh, retirement savings. Uh, this shows the um, power of starting small and the importance of starting early. So in this illustration, we're going to display two women, Susan and Maria. So we have Susan here. She, right out of school, said, you know what, I'm going to start saving immediately. Something very small, just 100 bucks a month. She saved that for 20 years. And then for 10 years, she didn't save anything. So we're talking about a 30-year time frame. And then her friend Maria, she said, no, I'm going to wait. I want to pay off credit cards. I have student loans. I want to buy a home. I want to buy a fancier car. I'm tired of being a broke college student. So she waited. And I hear this story often. And so she waited 10 years before she actually started saving anything. But because she knew that she was behind her friend Susan, she started saving 200 bucks a month. So she saved the back 20 years of that 30 year time period. And so let's see who actually ended up with more in savings. And we're assuming an 8% rate of return linear. And as you can see here, Susan actually outperformed with half of the amount of savings that her friend Maria had. And the power is behind compounding. A dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. Uh, we're talking about about 11% marginal difference, even with having saved double the amount of money. So my, my old adage I say to younger investors, is better to start small than with nothing at all. So um, just something to keep in mind of the importance of getting started today if you don't take away anything else that I say. So let's talk about some of the benefits of why a small business owner should even consider a plan at all, the benefits to themselves as well as to their employees. So from the business perspective, of course, you get the immediate gratification of a tax deduction. So all of these plans will, you know, encompass, you know, a tax deduction, so a buzzer line from below, it all depends. Um, and then the opportunity also, to recruit and retain top talent, it's becoming ever more increasing to have a strong benefit package so that you're keeping quality employees. And then, of course, increased savings for the, own, uh, the owner's retirement themselves. A lot of business owners look at their business as their sole retirement asset, meaning I will sell my business you know, at age 60 and it will be worth millions, and that's my plan. And oftentimes... It does not work out as they plan. So this allows you some diversification to having some liquid assets set aside in addition to the tangible asset of your business. 
And then from the employee perspective, uh, the three-legged stool term is what we use in financial planning to describe um, the sources that you will have in retirement for income. So you'll have Social Security, whether it's 100% or not is debatable. Um, then you will have the employee retirement benefits like the 401ks, um, like the set plans we'll talk about, like pensions, and then as well as your personal savings that you've done on the side. So the employer benefit plans are traditionally the largest percentage of that three-legged stool. Most clients that come to me, the majority of the liquid assets are with their employers. So that's the benefit there. Um, simplified funding. Um, it's essentially an automated process. You choose the percentage and it's automatically coming out of your employees' paychecks. They don't have to think about it. They don't have to debate each month how much they can afford to do. It just becomes like another deduction out of the check. So it really helps to streamline that process. They receive matching contributions. So with most all plans, there is a requirement for the employer to contribute on their behalf. So that's a great savings incentive. And then, of course, the tax deferral growth, like with the 401k and with IRAs, you're not taxed each year on your growth. So that's great. It allows the investments to compound at a much faster rate. And then more importantly um, is the employee morale. They feel a, a sense of worth and value from the employer and a sense that they actually appreciate it. And that, that can't be measured. Extremely important. Um, we're going to do another poll question, and we'll let uh, Ellen take over from here. So how much could you afford to contribute to a retirement plan in 2017? And I have different uh, varying amounts here, and this will help me to gauge the areas of concentration as far as the small business plan I'll talk about today. Okay. Looking good here. And these numbers do have some significance is why I chose these these ranges here. It's some of the uh, kind of break points between different plans. Perfect. Okay, so it looks like it's an even keel with zero to five thousand from six to twenty four thousand. Um, and so I'll get into those limits and why I chose um, those amounts. And Daryl, um, essentially that will help me to spend less time on the pension plans. Uh, pension plans have one of the highest uh, contribution limits, up to 215000 but they are very much more uh, complicated as far as explanation and as far as complexity. So. I'll spend more time on the 401ks and the IRAs, since that's where it looks like the audience would have uh, more of an interest. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So we'll start with the IRAs. So the SEP IRA, what that stands for is a Simplified Employee Pension Plan. And then the SIMPLE stands for Savings Incentive Match Plan for Employees. <laughs> very long, <laughs> very long title. And then uh, the qualified plans, uh, what I was just mentioning about the pensions, pensions would fall under defined benefit plan. And defined contribution is street name, essentially is 401ks. <laughs> it's what most people would know them by. So let's get started with IRAs. So from when I was speaking with Wendy and speaking with Ellen, they told me that a lot of their clients are good candidates for the SEP IRA. Um, and they often deal with this plan a lot, so I'll kind of park here a little bit and give you um, some detailed information about it. The, the benefit between both of these plans is they're very cost effective, very easy to administer. It's a simple finding a broker dealer like an Ameriprise or like your bank and telling them you want to open this up. They have you sign an application, you deposit your money, and you're done. It's a very simple process. Um, the employer funds these plans. This is not... Um, this is not something, well, the simple IRA, you're able to make contributions, but the employer is uh, mandated to contribute to both of these plans. So that's very important if you have employees before you choose one of these IRA plans. So with the SEP, 
The SEP is the most frequently used in my practice, and I can tell also with Daryl's. Um, employer contributions can be up to 25% of their compensation of the employee's compensation, no more than that. And the maximum is 54000 in 2017. So the contribution, whether you're a, a, a one-person shop, meaning I'm the owner and the operator is no one else, uh, the max you contribute is 54000 and then the good thing about the SEP IRAs is you're able to open them and fund them up to the, the extension file date, the October 15th date. And so that allows you for the previous year, by the way. So a client can come to me on October 10th and make a $54,000 contribution to get the deduction for 2016. So that is a benefit of the SEP that's very unique. Um, on a negative side, there are no lending capabilities. And the positive side, there's no vesting, meaning when the employer contributes on your behalf, there's not a, a scale, there's not a, a break point to where you need to work for them for a certain amount of years to actually own these assets. As soon as the contribution is made, you are the 100% owner of those assets. And like I said before, the government reporting, there is none. Uh, you simply would get a 5498 from tax form from the uh, custodian of your IRA, meaning your bank or your broker dealer. If you took money out, you would get a 1099R. So it's a very simple process. Daryl, did you want to add anything to that? No, no, you're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> Here's some other features of the SEP that uh, a lot of people are unaware. And, and keep in mind with these eligibility restrictions, they can be less restrictive, they just cannot be more restrictive. So if you want to have an employee that's 18 years old to be in your plan and contribute for them, you can absolutely do that. Um, one of the features that I utilize a lot with my clients that have employees but have a high turnover is we utilize this three of the past five years rule. So there is an option for the employer not to contribute on behalf of their employees until they've worked for them for three years. Now, you know, keep in mind that three years doesn't mean, oh, they worked every single day for 2016. No, if, if they work for you for any one day and receive compensation, that's considered one year of compensation. So keep that in mind. It's a little different with 401k. They have a little bit more restrictive ruling on that. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, and it will make sense for an employer who not who does not want to necessarily contribute on behalf of their employees, but wants to contribute on behalf of themselves. But also keep in mind the owner is also held to the same restrictions that he places or she places on her employees. So you can't say that I want to contribute this year um, and, you don't know, if you're young and I'm, I don't know, 18 and then say the restriction is 21 and you want to contribute for yourself. So just keep that in mind uh, that you are held to the same restrictions as your employees. And keep in mind, all the contributions have to be the same percentage for each employee. So if you contribute 10% for yourself, every employee then receives 10% of their compensation as well into their own IRA. It will be your IRA in their name, not the company's name. And the employer simply pays the employee with a check or through some direct deposit into that IRA and then the employer receives a tax deduction for any contribution made to their employees. Now with the simple IRA, and Daryl, did you want to add anything or have any questions as far as with the, the SEP IRA that comes up often in your practice? Um, yeah, I think uh, for those clients that um, that haven't set it up, it, it, it often is a challenge for them to, to realize the value uh, in doing the SEP, but, but certainly the big advantage from a tax standpoint is being able to deduct that, that expense or defer the taxes um, uh, on that income that uh, based on the contribution. So that's, that's a real benefit of doing it from a tax perspective, but, but I know you're really uh, focusing on the added benefit that 
um, they they they're not spending it on something. They're actually putting it away for themselves. So it's just really giving you a tax benefit for saving. Absolutely. It's a big deal and it allows one of the highest contribution allocations among all the different retirement plans. The, the SEP IRA gives you one of the highest um, availability. So it, it just really makes sense, especially if you can't afford to, to max it out. It should definitely be done while the cash flow um, is, uh, is strong. And then the simple IRA, this is when I told um, Daryl's staff that essentially it's, it's not utilized as often. Um, as far as with retirement and small businesses, just really because there are other options like the SEP and with 401k um, becoming a lot more cost effective over the years, the simple IRA only allows deferrals up to 12,500. And if you're over the age of 50, 15,500. So a relatively lower contribution amount. Um, the employer uh, has to make a contribution for the employees. There are two different options that they can make, um, but the employees actually do contribute to their simple IRA on behalf of themselves, kind of like a 401k. They can choose how much out of their paycheck would go into that simple IRA. So uh, then the employer then matches based on their contribution. Um, very low administrative costs. Once again, it's dependent on the broker dealer, the custodian that they choose. Um, but once again, it's a simple application checking the simple IRA box, and then making their deposits as they need. Now, the deadline to establish the simple IRA is a little different from the SEP. It's October 1st and not October 15th. And with the simple IRA, uh, those contributions would be for that calendar year. So, yes. Let me ask a question on that, uh, Rashana. So when you say October 1st, you mean that is October 1st of the tax year or um, of the following, the year after? Of that, not the year after. So like SEP, you can make, you can still make contributions today for 2016. Right. Well, simple IRA is different. It is in fact like the 401k, it's the current year. Gotcha. Okay, yep. Great. Yep. So that's another that's another nuance. Um, also, uh, if the company is established after October 1st, they are given the option to set up their plan by December 31st. Hmm. So only if your company was open after October 1st can you have uh, this option. So when would you think it makes sense to do a simple IRA over a SEP IRA? If you know that yourself and your participants will not be contributing um, and will not have the need to contribute over the 15500 it really just boils down to that because it's a lot less flexible than any other plan. So it really would be the fact that, hey, I know myself nor my employees can afford to contribute more than $15,500 a year. Gotcha. All right. And you can change it, but just know the simple IRAs, it must be the only plan a business contributes to in a calendar year. So if you decide to, in 2016, I want to open up a simple IRA, um, and then in 2018, you know what, now we can actually start doing $24,000, $50,000 contributions, then you can open up the 401k, but you can't make contributions until the calendar, the next calendar year once that simple IRA is closed. Uh -huh. So little, little nuances. Um, with that simple IRA, and then you can have no more than 100 employees. So if you have 101 employees, then you can't do a simple IRA regardless. Okay. So little nuances, make it, it makes it a little bit more restrictive. And then also, these are the two options that the employer has to make the matching. So they have a mandatory matching. They can either do 100% up to the 3% of the employee's compensation, and just like in the parentheses says, they have the option to lower it to 1% for two years if they have cash flow constraints or they just don't want to make the contribution for whatever reason. They do have that option. Or method two is they make a 2% non-elective contribution, which means the employee does not have to make a contribution in order to receive 2% of their compensation. Employers rarely select method two. Okay. Rarely. Uh, so those are the two options with the simple. And so 
just like the question that Daryl asked before, who would benefit from a SEP versus a simple IRA? Generally, um, business owners who have a high level of turnover. I had a dentist, we had a SEP IRA that had a very high turnover, meaning they never really kept an employee more than a year or two. We did the SEP IRA. She could max out, but she didn't have to do it for anybody else because they never stayed that three year time frame. Um, also, if you're wanting to make a larger contribution up to that 54,000 or make more than that 15,500 a year contribution from the owner's standpoint, you're definitely going to want the SEP IRA. And then from the simple, definitely need to be a smaller company because you can't have more than 100 employees to so open up a simple IRA. Um, and then if you want to minimize fiduciary responsibilities, both of these plans are great for you, meaning fiduciary essentially means you're not responsible for the investment selections, the choices, the performance. Um, you're not responsible for the government reporting. So if you want less fiduciary responsibility from the business owner's standpoint, these two plans would work best for you compared to a 401k or a defined benefit plan like a pension. Daryl, would you add anything else as far as who would benefit? Uh, no, no, I think that's, that makes sense. Uh, it seems like the SEP IRA has greater, um, you know, greater flexibility um, and uh, especially with the amount that you can contribute. Um, so most of, uh, I guess most times we see the SEP plan, uh, have not seen very, any simple plans uh, set up. No, same here, that's the <laughs> same here. It's, it's just the idea of that lower contribution level. It just hasn't moved, it's just, it's just a very low level. So if you're thinking of growing, um, it doesn't leave you much flexibility. So we'll can jump right into the- can I ask a question yeah. real quick before we move off of those? What is a good what is a return on investment for this? The, let's just just stick with the SEP. What are what are what are what is the uh, return on investment these days? So it all depends on the investment you choose. So it goes back to, you know, you have your own IRA with your own investments that you've chosen with your financial advisor. So there is not one rate of return you can assign to any of the retirement plans I'll talk about today. Oh, because they're okay so you can go high risk and high in or low risk and absolutely okay. you can choose to buy all apple inside of your SEP IRA okay <laughs> all apple stock you have no restrictions because it's your own individual retirement account so it's between you and your advisor on what you choose to buy and sell okay great okay thank you mm -hmm. so right. with the 401k uh, to Ellen's point there are restrictions as far as investments the advisor will choose the investment lineup along with the, you know, the administrator, generally the business owner, they agree on the lineup of investments. And so there will be, let's say 10 to 20 choices that the employees will have. So that's a big distinction between those IRAs versus the qualified plans. So this once again, gives you a summary of some of the differences. One of the big things is typically much more costly. Um, not typically it is. It's more costly to administer uh, the qualified plans than it would be an IRA um, because you have reporting costs, you have sometimes actuary costs that have to be done, non-discrimination tests that have to be run. Um, so all of those different uh, requirements are often fee-based. And so they are a little bit more costly to give you an idea, uh, an average or a relatively small plan 401k may cost you between $1,000, $1,200 a year to administer versus with the SEP IRA, it can vary based on the assets, but a lot of IRA fees are like 50 bucks a year to give you an idea, maybe, maybe 60. So just to give you the disparity there in cost. Um, and then the good thing though with the qualified plans is that they have a lot more features like the lending feature, profit sharing feature, and they allow you higher deductions, even more so than the SEP. So let's get into the 401k. This is essentially one of the most popular um, here in the States is the 401k plan. And essentially you're gonna see here the features of the plan, 18,000 um, is the amount if you're under 50 and 24,000 is the amount you can defer over the age of 50. Uh, a great point that it has that's unique is the profit sharing piece over here that's zero to 25%. It is discretionary. So the employer has the option to do this from one year to the next. 
So they can decide if they have either they want a deduction, sometimes it's done for that, or sometimes they just want to reward the employees for a great year, for great revenues. But the deal is, is it has to be a fair allocation of this profit share. They can't choose to give Ellen 15, and then I'm going to give Wendy 10, and I'm going to give Jose 11. It has to be a certain structure, and I'll go into that in a different slide. Um, a lot of people are not aware that the 401k, you can't have an aggregate contribution of 54000 And if you're over 50, it will be 60000 How that's made up is your pre-tax, 18000 or if you're in a Roth 401k, after-tax, 18000 Then you have whatever matching or profit sharing that your employer has put into the plan. And then the amount that's left between the 54000 or the 60000 is the amount you can contribute to after tax. And when it means after tax, it means you do not get the tax deduction, but in most plans, you have the availability to take that those funds out while you're still working at the company and before you're 59 and a half and roll them over into a Roth IRA. So that's a strategy I utilize a lot with my clients that make over the salary cap to open up their own Roth IRA, I utilize the after-tax portion within their 401k because it doesn't have any income limitations. You can make a million dollars and do this strategy. So we can put in the after-tax money, let's say 20, 30,000 is what they have left after their contribution and the employee contribution. We put that in after-tax and then the next year we do a direct rollover of the after-tax money into their own Roth individual retirement account. And that's the way they can build tax-free assets in retirement. So it's a strategy that's underutilized and most people are unaware of. But your plan has to allow for after-tax contributions. Some plans do not. So the easy way to check is to go into your online portal and go into the contributions tab and it will have pre-tax, Roth 401k, after-tax, and if it doesn't have after-tax there, you know you don't have that capability. Another feature it has for 1Ks is loans um, that's utilized by small business owners as well as employees. And one thing to remember with the loans, the max you can, con max you can lend to yourself is $50,000. Even if you have a million dollar account, you can only do a $50,000 loan. Otherwise, it's 50% of your balance, whichever is lower whichever is lower. Um, there are vesting requirements as well, but I'm sorry, let me go back to the loans. You have to pay that back within five years. Um, or if it's a primary residence um, home purchase, within three years, you can spread out over 30. But that should not be the intention. It should only be to lower your payment. But you should still try to pay off that loan within that five-year IRS uh, requirement. And then with the vesting, the vesting is only applicable to the profit sharing, not to the money that you're contributing, meaning your salary deferral. It's not applicable to the company match, only to the profit sharing piece. So there will be different, and I'll go into that slide, different um, formulas the employer, employer can use to determine how long does it take before all of this is your money. And then the Roth 401k option is something new, probably probably within the last five, 10 years, it's been seen more often. And essentially, your money goes in after tax, your salary deferral, so no tax deduction. But when it comes out, all of the gains and all of your money you deposit it come out tax free. But once again, I choose to utilize the after tax feature as opposed to recommending the Roth 401k option, just so my clients can receive that $18,000 or $24,000 pre-tax deduction. It just makes sense. So we'll go on here. This is what I was talking about, about the profit sharing. The most popular is the pro rata. Everybody gets the same percentage. I have $100,000 to give. Everybody gets 10%. Or however it works is, you know, based on compensation. Age weighted is another popular one to where they want to reward those or if the employer um, actually is older and wants to get more of the money, then they will do an age weighted formula. And then, of course, integrated, higher paid. They don't use this as often because it seems discriminatory. And the new comparability is a very complicated calculation that we won't get into today. So I'll move on here. The safe harbor piece is very important because 
with a normal 401k without the safe harbor addition to it, then the employer does not have to make any type of matching. A lot of people think that is a mandatory thing that employers have to do. It's not true. They do not, they're not required to do so. Um, the safe harbor though, it takes out all of the discrimination testing, which makes the plan more expensive. But with the addition of the safe harbor, the employer now does have to make a matching contribution. Um, and then the matching, once again, does not have to be done if an employee if an employee does not make a contribution. And generally that matching minimum is 4%. But once again, it lowers the cost of that 401k plan. So, you know, a very high percentage of employers uh, choose a safe harbor 401k versus the standalone 401k. Daryl, did you want to add anything in regards to the 401k? Um, yeah, I'm thinking of numbers. I guess that makes sense. Um, <laughs> uh, so in terms of the types of plans that you typically set up, what percentage would be 401ks um, versus SEP IRAs? What, what do you think that falls for most small businesses? SEP IRA is definitely the majority mm -hmm. um, because most of my small business owners do not have many employees, meaning they either there are once person shop or they may have five to ten employees max um, and they have relatively higher turnover so that so my percentage is going to be I would say 70 percent set 30 percent 401k if oh. even 30 percent okay mm -hmm. yeah and and the reason why is this because their intention is not to max the contribution for their employer employees that's mm -hmm. not their intention and they have people that just come and go. All right. Mm -hmm. And so with individual K, okay, this is one that I, I've been doing more often. These are for businesses with no employees at all or just their spouse. And so this one is even more simple. You're talking about as far as administration, you're talking about 75 bucks to set up is one of the plan providers I use and 315 bucks a year to administer. So um, very cost effective there. Um, they still have the same benefits as a 401k, meaning the 18,000 contribution limits. You can add the loan feature on there, the Roth component as well, but it is exempt from discrimination testing. That makes it more expensive because it's only one person, so you can't discriminate against yourself. <laughs> so it makes it very simple. You also don't have to file that form 5500 until you're at $250,000 in assets. So once again, just simplifying the cost all together. Um, keep in mind, uh, you also can do up to 60000 if you're over 50 into these type of plans. Mm. Wow. And so a lot of people uh, don't fully utilize that benefit. So essentially, just to kind of summarize between these two plans, what would be the benefits? Individual K, obviously, if you have no employees, that's when I talk to you about this particular plan, and you want to maximize your contributions. So you can do more contributions into the uh, individual K than you can the SEP. Obviously, you have the loan uh, capabilities as well. So if you need to lend to yourself for whatever reason, whatever business expense, some pressing issue, then the individual K would be best. Um, as far as the 401K, who would benefit from that would be um, a business or an organization um, that does not want to match employee contributions. So once again, unless they add that safe harbor component, the 401k does not have to contribute on behalf of employees. So that's this is the only plan, 401k without a safe harbor, to where an employer can choose not to match, not to contribute. So that's when I would bring up the, um, the, uh, the 401k. But it's going to be a more expensive plan. They're going to have to do that discrimination testing. And sometimes that means the highly paid employees can't contribute as much as they want to. I've seen that happen. So we have to have a lot of questions, but um, sometimes it, it, it's the best solution. Um, keep in mind also, if you're concerned about potential litigation because of the business that you are or protecting assets from creditors, um, this 401k is going to be your safest um, asset. The SEP IRA and SIMPLE IRA uh, would only protect you from creditors, but not all types of litigation. Mm -hmm. 
in Texas, you would have to look at the individual laws in Texas to see what it protects you from here. Um, but it, IRAs protect you from the creditor, but the 401k protects from creditor and potential litigation. Um, let's see, if your business is growing and you want the flexibility to, to have a plan that's robust, the 401k is definitely going to be um, the most feasible plan for you just because it can grow with your business. You know, of course, everyone knows Fortune 500 companies, they even have 401ks. They have the profit sharing component. You can do the matching. Um, you can lend from that. I mean, so it's it's a myriad of, of benefits there. Daryl, do you want to add to any of the benefits from either of these plans? Um. Yeah, so uh, maybe more of a question. Uh, so when you have an individual 401k or or just a 401k that you set up for your business, uh, I, I'm assuming you can roll over. Uh, well, I'm not assuming I know the answer, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but confirming uh, the answer, uh, you can roll over funds from another plan into that plan, right? Absolutely. So with every plan that I have mentioned, uh, from the SEP to the simple, they do accept rollover funds. So if you have separated from service, you were a W-2 employee, you've, been, you've now started your own business, you can roll over your 401k into either the SEP, into the simple, into a new 401k, or into a separate IRA in your own name. Yeah. Um, you know, when we talk to clients about setting up a retirement plan as a um, as an option to cut their tax um, tax costs you know you almost see a um, there's a reluctance uh, to do it because um, you know they lose control of the funds um, but wh what are some of the reasons that you've heard over the years of why people want to delay setting up a, a, a retirement plan and I'll be honest I don't hear it often because most of the times, you know, when they come to me, they know that they need to start setting away liquidity. And what I remind them is that these are still your assets. Yeah. You still do have an aspect of control. What their concern is the taxes and the penalties if I pull it out. Yeah. Um, so that will be their concern. And so the 401k would be the best answer to them as opposed to the SEP because they could borrow. I would caution against it but they would have that option to borrow with the 401k. So that would be my recommendation to them as opposed to any of the IRA solutions. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I remind them that it's very important to have liquidity um, as opposed to looking at your business as your sole retirement plan. Just like any investment, I wouldn't put all of my uh, clients in the same stock yeah. and expect you know, to get the best result. Same thing with your business, diversify outside of it. Yeah, I, for, I forgot. By the time they come to you, they've already made the decision. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you're you're not you're not at that point. But um, I, I'll also add, um, and this relates to both the IRA and the uh, 401k that that there are uh, exceptions to the early withdrawal pen penalty uh, on the, uh, the tax, and there's several of them. Um, you know, so if you um, start uh, school, uh, so qualified higher education expenses is an exception for IRAs, not for 401k. Um, but uh, if you have total or permanent disability of the IRA owner, that different uh, reasons where you wouldn't have that penalty. So, um, so usually you have, you, you may have a way if if the worst case scenario happened and you had to pull the funds out, that you wouldn't have that extra penalty. Absolutely. And then you have the um, the medical expense exception, but um, it's harder to reach because it has to be 7.5 percent of your modified adjusted gross income. So it's usually tougher. It, it has to be an you know, exorbitant amount of medical expenses to reach that. But yes, death, of course, disability, medical expenses, um, qualified higher education expenses. You can't avoid the 10 percent penalty. You won't avoid taxation. Right. <laughs> so right. That's a difference. Yeah, it'll still be taxed. That's right. It'll still be taxed. It will be, taxed, but it will be Yeah, it won't be the extra extra penalty on it. And uh, so uh, at least that gives them some comfort in knowing that if they really did have to get to it, they could and not have any uh, extra costs. Um, you know, and so 
it's always a good tax deduction because um, once you file that return, though, you can't do it. So you've already you got to make that decision before you file your return. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. That's important to understand. Yeah. And it, and just keep in mind, you know, you want to have two like a three legged stool. That demonstration I brought up, you know, if you're talking to clients and they're hesitant about um, starting their own personal savings, you know, ask them, you know, the security they have in the Social Security system. And so if you take and most people don't have a relatively high sense of, of security there um, and for good reason. If you look on the front page of your statement, you'll see that it even says insolvency um, is expected in uh, the late 2030s. I think it says 2038 or something. Um, so where that benefit shown on your uh, statement may be only 70 percent of that value. Um, so it's a reason. Uh, that people feel the way they do, but if you have less security there, you need to be building additional liquid assets to supplement retirement income. And so the onus is on us. Uh, we have much less pensions out there as far as employers. Um, so, you know, I tell people it's just re-diverting your assets. It's not as if you're losing anything. You know, you're not giving the money to me at Ameriprise. You're giving it to yourself. You're getting a tax deduction, and those assets are growing at a tax deferred rate and compounding much faster than they could in a checking account. So, yeah, something to think about. Um, and then here, divine benefits. Based on the questions and how the, the poll question ended, most people may not be a good fit for this, but what I'll do is I'll at least go through the attributes and the features of the plan. So if anything changes, you have an idea of this might make sense for me now. So with the defined benefit plans, like I said, street name pension is essentially the employer does all of the contributions. There are no employee contributions. The employer is responsible for the investments as well. The employer is responsible for the government reporting, for the actuary uh, tests, for making sure the divine benefit each year is uh, making the required contributions. The divine benefit plan has to offer an annuity option to the plan to allow people to have income for life feature. So if anybody's heard of TRS, Teachers Retirement System, that's one of the popular, more popular plans in the U.S. This, that is a defined benefit plan. Um, so uh, those people actually in TRS, they don't even contribute to Social Security. So that's, you know, it's a whole different discussion. But um, essentially, it's a more costly plan. The one plan that I've done um, for defined benefit, it's a couple thousand dollars a year. And that was just for one participant. It was one man owner. And he wanted to max out, put in about 200000 a year to himself. And because he was older, it made sense. I mean, he was over 60. It made sense because the older you are, the higher the actuary will tell you that a contribution can be made on your behalf. So it makes much more sense for older owners to establish a defined benefit plan than uh, a younger owner. Younger owner, they're saying they will qualify as below age 40. This is what they would, IRS would qualify as younger. And so essentially, um, the plan is responsible for the rate of return for the cash balance plan, meaning they guarantee the employees that this plan will earn four, five, six percent, whatever they agree upon. And so they have to make a contribution each year. And if the plan actually only makes 3%, it was supposed to make 5 the plan administrator, the owner, is on the hook to contribute more money so that it's funded completely. So it really serves as a liability on the balance sheet, pensions, um, to the owner. And so that's why they are not being utilized as much as they were 50 years ago especially since you've had the invention of 401ks and these SEP IRAs and all these different other vehicles that put the employee at, you know, in the driver's seat. And so essentially uh, a lot of defined benefit plans are paired with 401ks, defined contribution plans, this last bullet point here. They're usually coupled with that. I see it a ton in the energy space. Um, so most, you know, whether it's ConocoPhillips, ExxonMobil, whomever, they have a pension, 
very robust pensions, and then they'll have a full one k that the uh, employee actually contributes to themselves. So once again, uh, two hundred and fifteen thousand is the most the contribution can be made uh, to one participant in 2017. So once again, when you have a very strong cash flow and you're older and a larger disparity to your uh, other employees, then this tends to make sense for you. And you want to start making, you know, more than $60,000 a year in contribution. That's when I start talking to you about defined benefit plans. But you have to be okay with contributing on behalf of employees and taking on the liability if the uh, underlying investments do not perform as expected. Uh, the cash balance plan um, is an above the line deduction and it's not subject to that income phase out limits of below the line deduction. So that's a, a very good um, feature that it has that's very distinct. Um, it's a dollar for dollar offset to the income. Um, for the business owner, so it's it, it has a strong case if they have the cash flow to support it. It is protected by the Pension Guarantee uh, Corporation as well, so it does have an insurance component. So that's another way it, it guarantees in case the business goes out, um, the business goes out of business, they do have an underlying um, pension guarantee, so so the employees can still get their funds. So so Rashana. Um... I'm taking it that uh, you'd see this in a situation where the owner has um, maybe maxed out on what they can contribute in a defined contribution plan. Exactly. And they they want to do more um, investments, so that's um, that's where you'd see these most often. Exactly, and it's it's generally when I've actually had them or when my colleagues will have this issue come up, they're a one person shop, mm -hmm. and so we don't have the the detailed conversation of really needing, you know, very detailed actuary calculations for all the participants and their ages and all that. It's generally one person and they're older. So it wouldn't make sense for somebody who's in their thirties that can still make more than the $60,000 contribution because the amount, and I think we talked about this with one of your clients, the amount they contribute would still be nominal and they would be right. having this relatively larger cost to administer the plan. So, yeah. I don't even really bring it up unless someone's about 50 years old, not even really in their 40s. I would recommend 50 and up before it really starts to make sense. So are there limits on how much they can contribute? Um, well, the employer does all the contributions. Um, and so, yes, the limit is 215000 in 2017. But that, once again, is based on age. Right. Yeah. So they, the actuary has to do the calculation. And so this person I talked to that it was a possible um, solution, they were in their 30s. It didn't make sense at all. They weren't anywhere near $215,000 that they could contribute. Mm, gotcha. So we decided to do profit sharing so that they can get some uh, profit sharing within the 401k to get some additional deductions. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or it's, it's different life insurance plans. That's something we didn't talk about here. But it's different life insurance um, ways that business owners will often utilize to save as well. And that's, once again, an individual thing. That's an individual life insurance policy on yourself. You don't have to account for any employees at all. So that's another solution that I've used that I didn't touch on. So you can build, essentially, we call it an overfunded life insurance plan. It's, it's a cash value plan. And they're making relatively large contributions. So the largest one I have now is they make about ninety thousand dollar a year contribution to mm -hmm. this plan, and then the cash value grows, and you know it's expected to be hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, at a certain period of time. So with with life insurance, though, um, they're they're contributing after tax dollars. Yes. And then, but the but the big benefit of it, uh, I would think, is that. Um, when the or when the beneficiary receives the life insurance, it's not being taxed. Well, no, they can actually the owner who mm -hmm. actually owns the policy and is the insured, they can actually take out the cash value while they're living, and it's oh, tax free. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's yes, if they pass away, the beneficiary does receive it tax free as well. But the plan is that they'll live to enjoy the the, the cash <laughs> inside of the plan. Right. And when yeah. they get the cash out, it's tax free to them. Okay. All right. 
Okay. And so essentially I have covered all of the different plans and this is the cash value. I mean, the cash balance plan that I was talking about earlier and some of its features. And we talked about who would benefit there. And so essentially I've covered um, in, with the life insurance about five different um, ways that you can set aside funds, um, tax beneficial funds for retirement. And so uh, I always offer, me and my practice always offer complimentary consultations um, and for more detailed questions and to evaluate your situation uh, more specifically. So I'll always offer that uh, to any of Daryl's clients. Here's my contact information as well. And then I will give it back on over to Daryl and his team. Okay. Well, um, Rashana, um, I think I've, we, we've known each other for a few years now. And um, yeah, yeah we've, we've been able to um, refer uh, back and forth to each other. And we definitely appreciate uh, your presentation today. I, I, I think one thing that, um, that I've found and, and, and heard from our clients that have come to use you is that they really appreciate the, the way that you, um, yeah, you pretty much, you break it down to us for them and, okay, and good. make it easy for them to understand. And, and, um, and, and definitely with your practice, you, you all have, um, access to do whatever, uh, our clients need in the financial planning area. So we appreciate you. And, um, I think we may have a couple of other questions. Ellen, did we have a couple of other questions that were out there? Um, when is it acceptable to borrow from your 401k? Great question. Uh, <laughs> so essentially, I have a strong opinion on it, but I'll be very objective. Uh, it would need to be dire is, is my quick answer. And the reason why I say that, because what will happen is, and I see it often with business owners, um, no slight at business owners, but they will essentially use their 401ks as piggy banks and look at it as cash savings, uh, whether it is for a trip I can't afford, whether it's I need a new car, um, a down payment on a home, and all. And so what ends up happening is they justify it with I'm paying myself back with interest because when you take a loan, there is interest, generally LIBOR plus one, um, that you're paying back. But what you have to remember is that when you're paying it back, you're just getting back to even. So if you take out 50000 you pay it back within five years you're missing out on the opportunity cost of what that 50,000 could have grown to in the five years. Could have been 75,000. And those amounts add up the more loans you take. You can only have one loan out at a time. You can't constantly take more loans. But uh, what you're missing out on is the growth of the funds that you are borrowing from yourself. And you're just getting back to that 50,000 in the five years. And so it slows down your retirement goals and it, it keeps, it sets you back. It's a constant setback is what you have to keep in mind. So it would need to be a dire situation where I have literally no other avenue uh, to, to either borrow the funds or use my cash savings, and this is it. This is all I have. That's my opinion. Daryl, you can chime in. Oh, no, I, I, I totally agree. I think that, um, you know, even when people think about it in comparison to credit cards. Some, you know, if you have a credit card, you, you're going to hopefully pay that back in a quicker period of time mm -hmm. uh, to do whatever uh, the need is. But I mean, it's good to have the funds there and be able to get it if you need it. But I agree with you. It should be a, um, you know, last and dire situation before you, before you do it. So um, I agree 100%. And keep in mind, too, if you're employed, so if, if your 401k is with your employer, your W-2, keep in mind a lot of these plans, when you terminate employment and you still have a loan outstanding, they're going to go ahead and tax you on that if you roll out your 401k. I only had one company to where they allowed the severed employee to continue making monthly payments to their 401k loan. They allowed them to roll out the funds that weren't part of the loan and keep the loan and pay it. Most will say, hey, if you want to take your 401k away from here, then you're going to be taxed on, you know, the remaining loan balance. So yeah. keep that in mind, too. Yeah. Well, uh, we're at the end of the hour, so definitely we want to thank um, our audience uh, for their attention and their presence today. And uh, definitely it's been a pleasure being with you and, and we welcome 
uh, you to contact us with questions at any time. Uh, we'd love to talk to you uh, about uh, how we can be of service to you and your business. And we hope that you can join us next month when we delve uh, into the topic of insurance for your small business. And uh, so that'll, um, that's always a fun topic. <laughs> so, so, so you all have a great weekend and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see you next month.